Hello! I hope everybody is well and having a great weekend. If you are tuned in to this today, to my Instagram Live, then you will know that I am going to be doing another episode, episode six, episode six of Life in Lockdown. So for those of you who have seen Fridays and who've also seen Saturday's episode, I hope you really enjoyed. But today I am very, very excited for our first international male guest. How can I describe him? Well, he is an author, he is a journalist, he's a broadcaster, he's an author of non-fiction and fiction, and I am very, very excited to welcome Musa Okewonga onto my life in lockdown. And I can see that he's just come on, so I'm going to accept his request and he will be with us very soon. Hey, how are you doing? You're right. Hello. How are you keeping? You well? You very well? I'm good. I'm very well. How are you? Great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely great. Absolutely great. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure. I was very excited. I don't know if that came across. Yeah, no, it did. It did. It did. Absolutely. <laughs> good. So, I guess my first question for you really is, how is life for you right now? It's really good. It's really good. Um, I've got good perspective. Um, I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well, cooking some new meals, experimenting now and again, and just taking stock really, working on new projects and really enjoying myself. Yeah, it's good. How are you? How are you? How are you doing? I'm good, yeah. I've, um, I've been very positive during this time actually. Um, it's given me the chance to kind of like pause and reflect and think about what matters in my life and the people that I want in my life and don't want in my life. Um, yeah, throughout it all, I've remained positive. Obviously, some days are harder than others, but obviously, I think this could be so much worse. Um, and there's people who are going through going through it, and I and I'm very fortunate and lucky. So, yeah, yeah I've just got to I've just got to remember that, you know. No, absolutely, that's how I feel about it too. Very much. So, I'm very lucky. Very lucky. Good, good. And so, um, for those of you who are watching this, um, my followers, then. Um, Musa is based in Berlin and um, Germany. I don't know if you know, but my dad's German. Oh my goodness. Where's he from? Yeah. Where's he from? Um, he's from Bremerhaven. Where, whereabouts is Bremerhaven? Is it in the... So that's, that's, that's a seaport. Oh, I've, nice. I've never, uh, yeah, I've oh, never been. It's in the north. Yes. It's north of Bremen. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. North of, it's beautiful. You know what, it's funny. I'm thinking of going um, for a writing break later this year up in the north, actually in Kiel, which is slightly further across than Bremerhaven, but up there is beautiful. North Germans are like, meant to be lovely, so I'm gonna check it out, looking forward to it. Oh, amazing. I've never actually been, because my dad actually um, lives in the Solomon Islands. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, he's really, he's been traveling. Wow, that's incredible. He has, yeah. So he was born in Germany, um, grew up in Australia, um, grew up between Australia and the Solomon Islands. Oh my goodness. But do you get a yeah. pass, you get a passport like that, don't you? You get like a do you have an eligibility for like a German passport as well? I think so. I, I think I should get one definitely. You're, like, you're half German. You're like you're more German. My goodness, you're more German than I'll ever be. And I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying that hard. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I I definitely need to. I've never been to Germany, so I definitely need to to come well, over. I mean, not for the next sort of year to eighteen months, but the looks. Well, of no. oh, <laughs> Oh my goodness. But your borders are open, aren't they? The British they borders. They are, yeah. It's wild. Like, they can play about closing their borders for years to actual people. And the yeah. second, second a virus comes along, it's like, yeah, have a party. It's like, no, that's like that country. It's honestly. crazy. I'll never it's understand. So, yeah, I'll never understand. It's so crazy. Never understand. Wow, we've got people joining. Look at this. This whole gang is coming in. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. People, people have seen me on my Instagram, so they're like, they're coming. Oh, in. great. That's great. Like, it's funny. So I guess the point of these chats, I've just been wanting to just connect with people, people that I admire um, on social media and friends. And um, I, I first noticed you on Twitter. I have, to, I have to confess. And your tweets, you can pack a lot into those 280 characters. <laughs> Honestly, you really, really, really can. And um, 
yeah, I mean, so much. This. They're articulate, they're deep. You're able to sum up what you express. Um, so wow. It's oh, just, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because um, maybe I benefit from them doubling the amount of characters you can use. But um, <laughs> also, I think there's something about Twitter. Do you know what? It's like, what I've noticed in terms of the power of Twitter is that if you send off a tweet at a certain time, and you never know when, but they can, they can find their way into like conversations, the national conversation. <laughs> like, so obviously being a journalist, sometimes I write an article, it's 800 words. But other times, if you write a tweet, it can like, it could like be quoted by someone or it could lead to someone thinking a certain way. And like something happened a few months ago. Someone was, I sent a tweet out about something and I saw like a radio producer I really respect using the same language that I was using didn't quote me directly, but I didn't care because actually my agenda is reach. My agenda is getting out ideas in as palatable form as possible. So for me, Twitter is like ready-made. Mm. It's, it's mm. bite-sized bite ideas in a way to work you see oh that's interesting just to get people thinking a, maybe a different way about something yeah i love that absolutely um so can you can you tell us obviously obviously with um where you are in berlin yeah obviously, obviously i'm in the uk um i think the government announcement is coming at seven o'clock yeah but yeah. you've had some restrictions already lifted that's right isn't it in yeah Asia. that's right that's right yeah um Okay, so just to give you a sense of the German context, um, they've been lifting restrictions. They're opening, I think, schools on Monday. They've opened quite a few shops um, already. Restaurants, bars and cafes are still being held back for a while. But we've been locked down, I mean, for about six to eight weeks here, you know, quite intensely. And there's a sense of relief, but the infection rate has risen quite sharply in just a few days. And you can sense that when you're out and about, more people in the streets, People out um, in parks, like having birthday parties, gatherings of 10 people, which is kind of like not allowed. And I'm just a bit concerned that in our relief to get out there more, we lose a bit of focus and the infection rate mm. shoots up. Now, I will say that Germany, you know, being in Berlin, our population is like almost 4 million. And we've had just over 6,000, I think, infections in terms of cases. But that's because Berlin's kind of an island. It's a town surrounded by forest. And mm. so that relative isolation for a city this size I think has protected it from the worst effects of of this virus for now. So I just hope, like, I hope you're going to be okay in the UK. I, I mm. hope we'll be okay here. I just hope people, you know, from the government down, maintain that discipline that's got us to this point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I certainly think from the UK we've had no discipline. <laughs> we've had no leadership, real leadership, no discipline. I honestly, I don't think this lockdown has been strict enough. I don't think so um, either. I don't think so. From what I've heard, it sounds awful. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, obviously, there was the B, um, B celebrations on Friday, which was just an excuse for people to have street parties and totally, um, you know, not uh, respect the, the two metre distance. Um, so God knows what it's going to be like in two, three weeks when the R rate goes further than one. It'll, good knows where it will go. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. So I just feel that we are, we, I think we're one of the last countries to, to lock down and we should have locked down weeks ago. And again, now we're already talking about lifting um, the lockdown. Oh, it's just it's just crazy for me. Yeah. It's just crazy for me. People are discussing lockdowns and we're like, we didn't even lock down over there. And you know, <laughs> lockdown really late. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to labour the point, but I've been thinking a lot about this recently, about, the fact that the government in the UK is doing a horrifying job, in my opinion, based on, you know, in comparison with other countries. Like, for example, even on the money front, I lost a significant contract worth over 2,000 euros a month. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to the German government about it, you know, applied for a fund, and within three days, thousands of euros in my account. Three days. Wow. Three days. That's an honest thousands of euros in my account within three days of me sending an email. I sent an email on Monday, had the money by Thursday. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, the, that's what's happening in Germany. People have to know that because it's a direct comparison. It's a wealthy country, it's a Western European country, large population, capacity for testing and tracing. This thing about the lockdown being eased in the UK, it's like, you don't even know how many people are infected because there aren't enough tests. Yeah. We, know, we know who's infected. We know who's infected because the testing here is really rigorous. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk about, oh, the German mentality is to be disciplined. No, 
people don't want to die. And if you give yeah. people instructions on how not to die, they'll take them. Mm -hmm. Wherever they are in the world, this mental, oh, the Germans are more orderly. The British mentality can't take this. No, because look how the, the British people, even with the, the limited instructions they've been given, have been fairly observant. If they'd said, do this, this, and this, people would have done it. Yeah. But they haven't been told to do it. And the one thing I want to say about this as well that makes me annoyed is, some other day wrote to me because I said, look, like, at what point are people going to get tired of this? And he was like, well, what do you expect them to do, Musa? What, what steps should they take? And I thought, you know what? It's not my job to do that. It's not my job to tell people how to um, stand up to the government. My personal view is actually they should stop giving them such high marks in the opinion polls. Mm -hmm. They should scare them. Even if you're a lifelong Tory voter, mm -hmm. when someone comes up to you in the street and they say, who would you vote for? Terrify them by saying, we vote for Green. Even if you wouldn't, lie to the pollster. So when the Tories look at the numbers, they'll be like, oh, my goodness, our numbers are dropping. Because all yeah. they really care about are poll numbers. So why are you rewarding yeah. them with poll numbers? They're literally responsible with their negligence for the deaths of your friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to go on about it, but it just frustrates me so much. Like, no, I, I, I'm really glad that you, that you think this way and that people from outside of the UK can see what's going on as well because it's yeah. complete negligence. And also this whole thing about not making the international comparisons. Well, you were happy to make the international comparisons when the UK looked better... Right. than Italy, Spain, and France. But now we look worse, don't make those comparisons. So, yeah, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't care what Germany does, and all of a sudden, there are protests in Germany. Now yeah. you're going, oh, there are riots. There are not... Okay, here's a good example. So today, on Twitter, I saw Robert Colville, who's over the Telegraph, tweeting that, oh, perhaps the behavioural scientists were right about the lockdown fatigue. And then James O'Brien from LBC said, why do you say that? And he said, well... I'm just thinking of the riots in Germany. I was like, riots? My friend lives around the corner from the riots. They've mm. been the same size since the lockdown started. They've never observed the lockdown. So they're not fatigued. They're basically yeah. a bunch of like meditating neo-Nazis and yeah. conspiracy theorist cranks from like the extreme left. I mean, they call mm. themselves left. They're actually not left at all. They're just like, I don't know what they are. Mm. And I said, if that is the basis for your argument for a, lock for a lockdown being lifted, when these people, A, never respect the lockdown anyway, and B... Mm are like part of a death cult. I mean, if you're a neo-Nazi, you're basically part of a death yeah. cult. If the, yeah. And you're like a respected journalist for The Telegraph, Robert Colville. So why are you basically saying, oh, the upset Germans are an excuse to lock down the UK? That, and that's how it works. That's it's so mm -hmm. cynical. And he's there on Twitter and I, I wrote to him, he didn't reply. Either he's muted me, which frankly, yeah. he's smart if he has by now, or mm -hmm. he's like, oh, Moose made a point that's actually valid. So he disappeared. This is what they do. You make a point and they go quiet. Very true. I mean, they're clutching at straws, aren't they? You they know, really are, at... yeah. It's, it's desperate, actually. When I saw Rishi Sunak, sorry to go off on one, when I saw Rishi Sunak say, saying, oh, people are getting addicted to the government support, I'm like, they haven't received it yet. <laughs> How can you be addicted to heroin if it's not even in your veins yet? <laughs> so true, absolutely. And there's, I think that there's already some, like, adverts are already changing now to say, from stay home to stay alert. And um, it's that this all highlighted in green. Now, obviously, green for me is a subliminal message of um, lifting lockdown, go. I mean, traffic lights, isn't it? Red for stop, green for go. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to work out what that means. Right, right. And it's like, get back to work. And it, you know, I will say about the UK, um, I've never seen a wealthy nation. When I, I've never seen, apart with the exception of the US, I can't think of a wealthy nation where the citizens are so relentlessly bullied by the government and the citizens take it. And what I've come to realise mm -hmm. is actually it's fine, they will accept the bullying because their countries are bullying other people. And yes, it's chaos, but this is the best available chaos. Yes, it's chaos, but it's our chaos. Yes, they're monsters. Yes, they lie to us, but there are monsters. That's what this <laughs> comes down to in the end. Like, that's why... <laughs> People say that um, so Boris Johnson is a great political survivor. Why is he a survivor? Not because he's a genius. It's because you give him infinite second chances. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's, oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if I did what he did, I'd be a great survivor because then there'd be no way. Did... But the fact, the way they talk about him, mm. with a sense of like reverence, mm. and it's embarrassing. I'm like, he's, these people are literally responsible for the deaths of yeah. your friends and family and your acquaintances, they're doing this in plain sight and they're laughing at you and you're taking it. I, I will never, mm. I'll never understand that in the UK. I'll never get it.
yeah it's so great to get your perspective because obviously you've grown up in london and now you've you can you know you're living in in berlin yeah. i bet you're very glad that you're out of the uk right now well i am because it means i can be less angry like i'm angry yeah. i'm angry for people in the country i'm angry for just just gender i'm angry for british people at the same mm -hmm. time i've got to be careful because i'm like wait a minute why are you angry for a country whose majority consistently vote for this this is what they want yeah. This is what they want. This is the this is the this is the grim, I think, and disappointing reality of this. This is how they like it. This is really sound awful, but this is how a majority of the country like it. Because if it wasn't, then the poll numbers would be different. There would at least yeah. there would at least be some kind of protest. At least when someone came along with their clipboard, going, "Would you vote for this government if there was an election tomorrow?" People are going, "Yeah, I would." That that to me is the deeply pernicious thing. And it's why, actually, the last few years, I've been a bit less bothered. I was like, why are you trying to help people mm. when the majority don't want to help themselves? Like, yeah. that, that sounds brutal, but it's like, how agonised can I really be? Like, you know, we've had chance after, people have had chance after chance after chance. What more do you need to see? The NHS is on its knees, um, food banks are on the rise. You know, there's so much happening and people just don't care. And now, more than 30,000, which I mean, I think we're close to 40,000, really. It's, meant to be, um, it's more like 50, it's over 50. I like, wouldn't be surprised. The numbers are wild. The numbers are like way underreported. I mean, people in care homes, I mean, they can't even get a test, you know. They're being wiped out. A generation is being completely wiped out because... Uh, no PPI. That, it makes no sense. How can you lift a lockdown when you haven't even got PPI, uh, no, not PPI, PPE? Yeah, yeah. How can you do that? You know, it's just... My friend's just aunt, insane. my friend's aunt, um, it's always good to give a specific example. So my friend's aunt died two weeks ago. She was 59. And oh. she'd been living around the corner from my friend who lives here in Berlin. She would have had a test the same morning she developed symptoms. Instead, she was sent home. Eight days later, she gets admitted to hospital. It's too late. They couldn't save her. If she was in Berlin, she'd still be alive. She was 59. And I don't know how available masks are in the UK, but I can go mm -hmm. to my local chemist and get a normal mask for like a couple of euros and get a really nice one, like a surgical one for eight euros. Mm -hmm. Like the kind of surgical mask, you can basically hand wash it. It's fine. Round mm -hmm. the corner. Oh. It is unacceptable that a prime minister, you have to be prime minister in the UK to get the same quality of care that my friend's aunt would have got. She'd round the corner from it. I can basically go, basically I'm 20 minutes from a testing centre from my front door. I can get a test the same morning. My friend got coronavirus. He got tested the same morning, quarantined for two weeks. Fine. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like a new world you're talking about that, I, that, I, that, I, that I'm not seeing here at all. It's yeah. just, I mean, 59 is young. You know, a 59-year-old shouldn't, shouldn't be dying. It, 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 it's wild. Just, it's wild. It's wild. It's crazy. And, and obviously now they've released um, that, that report on ethnic minorities. I mean, what's your, thought, what's your thoughts of that? Because obviously that's been a real um, yeah. talking point. Um, you know, I caught a glimpse of Afua Hirsch on um, Question Time, yeah, uh, and she was speaking about it. But I mean, what, what I mean, what's your thought, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it makes complete sense because if you look at the demographics in terms of frontline workers, a disproportionately mm -hmm. poor member of the population, you know, this black and like minority ethnic part of the population, dying at what like three, four times the rate of of white people. I mean, that you could draw analogies with the war. I don't like to, but. I mean, it's interesting because we just had Victory in Europe Day and I remember that, that piece um, by Franz Fanon, the great theorist, talking about the fact that when it came to Victory in Europe Day, he and a lot of his colleagues weren't allowed to go and march in Paris because they didn't want black people in the victory parades and the photos. If you look at those photos, a lot of those photos are basically all white soldiers, even mm -hmm. though non-white soldiers helped to win that war. Absolutely. We're, we're seeing a reproduction of those same patterns. I'm not saying anything new. It's so interesting. We've got this victory, victory for Europe Day, victory in Europe Day, and it's like, you're not honouring us now. You didn't honour us then. It's the same pattern. And you talk about this stuff, and people go, oh, my God, here you go, talking about race again. I was like, well, yeah, but we talk about race, and you act upon race. Mm. You structure societies upon race. It's like you, you hammer a nail through our foot, and you expect us not to scream. Hey, come yeah. on, man, come on. Yeah, it's a clown. It's, it's, 
it's just crazy, but you're so true because all those pictures you'd see of BE Day, you can't spot one non-white person. You can't. It's just not there. Yeah, like you it know? never happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, certainly in Wales, it took such a long time for us to honour um, those who died at sea during the war. Um, I mean, it literally took like 60, 70 years to get any sort of, um, you know, conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there was absolutely nothing. Um, so many people died for a country that never believed in them and never accepted them, you know, and that's, that's still happening today. You know, we are, people are not being accepted. People are not getting their basic health rights. Um, and this is just a clear example of that. You know, we're not, race isn't a thing. You, you know, you, they've got a problem with it quite clearly, you know. And it's wild. It's like black people and non-white people, they're relevant at certain points, but when it comes, it's almost like the adults in the room, when, when, when it's time for our issues to be raised, you can't find us on hardly any panel. You can't find our new, and it, it's something which I've seen in media, I've seen across the board, like, you had it in Germany to a certain extent when the, a lot of refugees were allowed in from Syria. <laughs> refugees, sorry, people fleeing war zones were allowed in from Syria. And how many Syrians did we see on TV? Almost none. And a bunch of middle-class white people, like, talking about people who've actually fled war zones and then demonizing them going oh my god they're going to drain our resources they've been bombed out of their actual homes we should be it's a miracle they're even alive mm. and we're not celebrating that it was so it's so strange this whole discourse which is you know i'm always arguing for more diversity mm. because the broader set of opinions you have the mm. less risk there's this stuff happening and the thing is daniel i'm sitting here in berlin now it's 2020 10 years ago Many of us were saying Boris Johnson's going to win the prime ministership. He'll, he'll win. I was saying this, me and my friend. I had a call this morning with a friend of mine. Shout out to mm. Rosie Knight over in California. We spoke 10 years about Boris Johnson winning um, his way into uh, 10 Downing Street. We said it 10 years ago. Wow. It's why we were overseas. It's why we left. Yeah. Like, people ask, oh, did you see this stuff coming? I was like, what country am I living in? I've gone. Yeah. Like, we saw yeah. it. And, and the thing is, here's the thing, Danielle, like I had quite a big platform, so did several people, but they didn't. I mean, Sonia Purnell wrote a great biography of Boris Johnson. How she was, I don't know, but she called it 10 years ago. But people don't listen to women. And they don't listen to people of color. We call yeah. Donald, people called Donald Trump 30 years ago. They knew who he was 30, 40 years ago. And they let him walk into the White House. And people are still sitting going, oh my goodness, we never saw this coming. No, actually, many people saw it coming, but you didn't listen. Mm. yeah always Definitely. always absolutely i mean it's just, i mean you you can't stay in a place where you feel you don't belong isn't it you know yeah, exactly. it's, it's, you just you just can't it, it, it's impossible i mean i saw that article the other day um in the in the telegraph about um since the, the report on um, ethnic minorities and the risk of uh, covid getting covid19 about a um, victimhood about and ethnic minorities um, somehow becoming a vic um, playing yes. victimhood. Did you see that? Horrifying. When they're dying, it says, yeah, the youth campaign activists are using this, um, the deaths as, as, a, as a way to push a victimhood agenda. They're literally That's victims because they're literally dying. Dying, People yeah. Are, you know, it's like when Katie Hopkins talked about um, Africans being cockroaches while they were actually drowning. Like, mm. she wrote this article about, you know, Africans being like cockroaches, being able to survive in any war zone and survived the refugee trail. And a few hundred died the day before she posted it. And the day after that she posted it, I think 700 Africans drowned on their way across the Mediterranean. 700, wow. while she's sitting at her laptop and laughing. It's genocide. Like, yeah, the, the UN actually said, this compares to pre-genocidal rhetoric. Mm. The hatred is so deep. It's white supremacy. And here's the thing, when we wrote about white supremacy, several of us a few years ago, People laughed. The sensible mm. people on Twitter laughed. They're not laughing now. They're quiet. They're quiet because they can't even say they were wrong. It's now mm. like, oh, oh, oh dear, the crazy, the crazy black guy was actually who's talking sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I get a lot. Of also, yeah, yeah, I get a lot of that. I get a lot of that. I, and the thing is, I think my mum, my mum actually said to me, I'm, I'm a bit worried now because people saying, you know, people. Um, you know, people of ethnic minority are more at risk. Could she, my mum was thinking of the lines as, you know, could people then in the street be like, oh, I better stay away from that person because they're of colour and what if they've got something in their genes that, you know, but also it, but I can understand her yeah. kind of anxiety around that because 
it doesn't it doesn't take a lot for people to um act out their true feelings you know no, it doesn't exactly. take a lot and the problem, the problem that England has, and I say England specifically, England is not quite honest enough with itself about how nasty it can be. Oh, we're the least racist country in the UK. It's like, I think one of my good friends, a novelist, uh, Rajiv Balasubramanian, posted today, goes, it's so strange it's calling yourself the least racist country. And to me, that's interesting as a framing. If someone says to me, Britain's the least racist country in the EU, my gut, or in Europe, my gut reaction is, no thanks to you. Mm. Like if you're sorry, I've got to drink some of this. Um, okay. If your um, framing of a country is it's less racist than here and there, then you're not addressing the actual problem, which is racism is actually terrible. The only reason it's not worse here is because police are not armed. Frankly, yeah. Only reason. Yeah. And then we give people a platform like Lawrence Fox, who who says this country, you know, we're a lovely country, and. And he was invited onto Question Time when loads of other people who were much more equipped, um, you know, to talk about the issues they were talking about, it gets invited on to, uh, to Question Time and becomes a massive hit, actually, with a lot of the general public. I mean, Twitter was one thing, but actually a lot of people were saying something completely else and agreeing with him. And that, to me, just shows how racist um, England is, um, especially... Because how could you agree with that? It's you know, a bulk of the country. You know, it's yeah. interesting. If you look at what they do with them, every, uh, <clears throat> every two years they get a new one. So it was, it was uh, David Starkey, then it was Katie Hopkins, um, mm -hmm. and now it's this guy. I've never even said his name before. I'm not going to say it now. They always get a new one. And um, it's like they rotate the strike. So what I always do when I critique people like that, I critique the structure. I said, look, look at the editors because the, the faces change, but the editors don't. The, the, so don't, when you look at the individual, for example, you look at the spectator right now, they've got particular people, the spectator are quite controversial. Mm. Look at like that guy, um, Fraser Nelson, who's the editor. He's mm. the guy to look at because he brings in these new people every time and they have these horrific opinions and once they get like too extreme, they just dump them and move on. So Katie Hopkins, they dump her and they move on to someone else. Mm. And I'm just interested in how the people holding the levers the producers, the editors are always the same. They don't get any stick at all. Mm. And there's this really cynical game that they play in the UK like that. It's like, almost like Punch and Juliet. Lawrence Fox is sitting there, and I've said his name now. He's, he's sitting there and he's kind of like, it's all a joke to him. Mm. It's like a public school bully. And that's why I take it quite personally, because I look at a guy like mm. him and think, and this is why I'm a bit annoyed, Danielle, because when I was at school, I saw people like that. And I knew people like that. And it was like, if we all fight as hard against them as I'm fighting now, we're going to be fine. Mm. You get out in the real world and you realise actually people aren't fighting or they agree with him. They didn't care. Mm. And at that point, I like, like, like you, I'm like, well, what's the point? I mean, I do still fight. I do still care about the UK. But I'm not as emotionally invested in the UK as I once was. And that's a really important difference. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really taxing, isn't it? You know, these are personal issues, you know. These are not things that you can really run and hide from um, because it, you know, as a person of color, it affects you, you know, and yeah. actually I think you're right. Taking yourself sometimes away from it gives you, a, um, you know, it, it, it's a healthier, it's a healthier, it's healthier for yourself then. Um, Cause when you're in it too much, it's, it's extremely, extremely taxing. Actually here's a word um, of advice to listeners. Can I just say before I forget, anyone listening, watching right now, if you're on Twitter, one thing I've done is I've muted certain names. I've muted Donald. I've muted Trump. I've muted the word Brexit. I've muted yeah. the word coronavirus. I've muted all these things because what I've noticed is, if you mute those key words, then you get the reports on those things about four or five hours later in article form. So instead of getting people going, Trump's done this, Brexit this, Brexit that, you get newspaper articles, yeah, which you then digest as you'd normally take in news. As instead of this kind of like hyper caffeinated, stressful, oh my goodness, this, everything's awful. So mm -hmm. I advise listeners to kind of take a step back and kind of um, relax that way, especially mm -hmm. people of colour, especially people of colour. Yeah, it's hard. It's so hard. I mean, you do, I mean, I don't really watch Question Time anymore because I, I, I go to bed feeling very anxious. Um, it's really bad for my mental health, actually. So I think you're right. That I think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. That show, that show shouldn't exist. 
Question time should not exist. They should replace it with investigative reports. Yeah. Panorama. They should have panorama twice a week. Yeah. Like, and reporting yeah. on financial corruption, like reporting on landlords gouging rents all over the city, developers doing corrupt deals. That, that should be the focus. They should just, mm. every evening should be like investigative reporting. And because question time, like debates, whose minds actually change by debate? And like Afwa's a friend of mine, Afwa's a dear friend of mine. Seeing Afwa on that show, the pledge, it's like a feeding frenzy. You get like a, a woman of color who's left wing and they gang up on her. And that's like, it's a mob mentality. No one actually learns anything because here's the thing. If those forums helped, we would have seen a shift against Tommy Robinson a lot earlier. They give him platforms. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my view on it. That's my view on it. It's, it's kind of like a bit like a Jeremy Kyle show, you know, it's, it's like a reality TV show. It's just like, and new benefits. They tried to get me on a show before I left the uh, UK. Just before I left, there was a Channel 4 show they wanted me to get me on. And the idea was there'd be a bunch of people, and one of them would be like a massive racist, and everyone would drink and get progressively drunk, and the, the debate would grow. What? Yeah, they invited me on, along with a bunch of other people, and one of them was this like, super racist guy, and clearly he was the star of the show. And they were ah. going to get me in there, basically be a minstrel, like basically a minstrel, like a black dude there being a sensible debater and a James Baldwin. Yeah. And they basically would have had that clown getting all the sound bites. And I clocked it for what it was and I said, no. Mm. And that, that happens now again. I'm, I'm not going to tap dance for you. Like, no. Yeah, yeah. Hell no, hell no. No, no, no. It's just, that's, and that's why, you know, you've got to, cre you've got to create your own work in, in a sense. Um, yeah. step, step back and, and that's why it's great what you're doing, especially on Twitter. You know, it's such a great platform. Um, to get what you feel and uh, across on there, I think it's much, it's much healthier in that way for, for yourself. Yeah. You can step back away from it. Yeah. Um, but I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about your memoir that's in development wow, right now. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. Because obviously we spoke about you spoke a little bit about Boris Johnson. Obviously, you know, you, he went to Eton as well. Is that he? Did he go to Eton? He did. Yeah. Yeah. He did. He did. He did. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to find out, you know, why you felt now was the time to write about it. Um, yeah, of course. Okay, so um, so the memoir is called uh, "How to Avoid Detection," and it's coming out in mid April two thousand twenty one. So we've got an official release date. Right. And I chose to write it because I was seeing all these like senior politicians, right in the Conservative Party and the government, and they, like six or seven of them, mm -hmm. all went to Eton. And not only did they all go to Eton, they're all like hard right. Mm. Like even Rory Stewart, who is, people look at as a kind of moderate, he voted for like a lot of really repressive policy. Yeah. So I was thinking, wait a minute, like if this school is about having leaders and ambassadors because you go to Eton, it's got like the heads of all the prime ministers, like it's got the bust of the prime ministers displayed around the college. So it's clearly very proud of the leaders it produces. But I was like, well, but what kind of leaders are they? Like if mm -hmm. we're meant to celebrate leaders, what has been, what's the ethos we're being taught? And then I started questioning myself and going, what is it about that environment that created them? Like they're mm. all the same type of person. And then I got invited to this, um, oh, sorry, Connor Flanagan just asked, were any there at the same time as you? So Rupert Harrison was the year above me at school, who was the guy that wrote George Osborne's austerity policy. So I knew Rupert. I knew him, not well, but I knew him. Knew of him, certainly. Um, Douglas Murray, who is like one of the biggest Islamophobes, frankly, in, well, biggest, in terms of his writing, so critical and brutal about Islam. Um, mm -hmm and critical in like quite a bigoted way. He was the year above me at school. So these people are my generation mm -hmm. who are advising the ones now. So I was like, I've got to write this. Also I got invited to like a 20 year anniversary. So I get invited back and I'm like, I felt weird because I felt firstly a bit, I guess if I'm honest, I felt anxious going back from a personal point of view. It's like, you know, most of them got off and made millions and I haven't, I've been like mm -hmm. a writer doing my thing. And to be honest, like I felt anxious about that because mm -hmm. it's not that, you go to a school like that and going and like becoming a writer is not really, if I'm honest, it's not a thing that's a celebrated thing. Not really. Like it's about making money, being a trader, being a hedge fund manager, whatever. It's about making big money. So I was anxious on a personal level, but on a professional level, I was like, I wasn't proud of that place anymore. Like I, 
I was a prefect at Eton. I was a decorated person. I was like, I ran like several societies. I had a great career. I had a career I could be proud of. But then I'm like, 20 years later, put it this way. If you said to me when I left Eton, 20 years from now, they're going to invite you back and you won't be sure, you'll hesitate. I'd have said, hey, like, that's wild. I won't, be, I won't hesitate. But now I'm like, I'm not sure I want to go. So the book basically is about whether or not, whether or not I go back to the reunion and why I don't go back. Right, okay. Yeah. So it's less about kind of your time there, because you had, from what you're saying, you had a great time there. It's more about your relationship with it with it now and your feelings towards the school and what it's producing and, and, and what it actually stands for from the people that, well, I go, that I go, go there. Well, I go into both. Yeah. I, I go into both, so I go back in time. Ah, so I thought it'd be okay. good to do it both ways. So I go back like to the very beginning and I trace it all the way through and I look at everything. I look at stuff that I did that I was happy with, stuff that I wasn't happy with. I criticise it. It's so honest. Like, I got the edits back three days ago from my um, editor, and she was like, oh, my God. Mm. She was like, the honesty is like, it's almost uncomfortable at certain points because you go all the way in. Like, you are completely mm. honest about the school, about your own critic your self-criticism. You're very brutal on yourself. You're very um, keen to say all the good things that happened, and I said, yeah, because I want to be nuanced. I want to say, this is a place that gave me great opportunity. It's one of the reasons I'm in Germany, because I studied German. And they taught me German well enough that I can live here and speak well in other cities. So Eton gave me that. At the same time, there are these structural problems. So hopefully, when people read the book, they'll be like, oh, this isn't a straight hatchet job. This isn't just some guy coming in. It's actually quite a nuanced analysis, critique, memoir of what what went on there yeah and that's my kind of that's my take on it really yeah fantastic because I think we have an opinion of schools like that but we don't really know the ins and outs of it and actually right. I think it will be a real um you know I'm sure it's going to be very personal um it's going to be uh an eye-opener actually and um, for a lot of people myself included so April 2021 yeah that's that right the... mid-April and there are parts of it when I was writing it I was nervous Mm. I was absolutely terrified. Someone wrote to me and said, are you going to mention that story? I was like, yeah. And they mm. were like, then they were like, whoa, like, it's brave to go back there. Like, yeah. you went all the way back there. There's one bit when I talk about when I was um, 14, 15, and I had quite homophobic views, actually, at that point. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to make excuses, you know, whatever. Mm. Leviticus, mm. all this stuff, like, you know, raised Methodist. But, but those were still my, that's how I was still processing stuff. So I made a homophobic remark, and my teacher... Shout out to Cathal Makoska. He's not named in the book, but I'll name him here because no one in the book is actually named because, right. I, because they, we were kids back then, right? So I yeah. this is my confession, not other people's. And he said to me, he's like, oh, Musa, like pretty strong views. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, um, do you know any gay people? I was like, no, I don't. And he's like, well, and I was like, I was like, who the hell am I? Like, yeah. I don't know. Who the hell am I? I don't even know. I just associate homosexuality with like, I associated it then with like weakness or whatever, just nonsense that you read from whatever. And I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. And that changed, like that conversation changed my life. So it talks about these incredibly positive, vulnerable moments. But it mm. also talks about the time when we were getting a coach home from Stratford upon Avon. We watched uh, Shakespeare at the Globe. <laughs> and we're coming back, and because it's quite a long journey back from Stratford upon Avon to Eton, we were. We thought we'd do a whip round for the driver, like put some money in an envelope, some change, some notes maybe for the driver. And so we're doing all of this, and one of the boys has this envelope full of money and starts emptying it into his top pocket. This guy's loaded. He's stealing the money just because he can. Just because he can. So I then go, I was like, dude, like, hey, come on, like, and I was terrified. He was the year above me, but someone in the year above you, they're like gods to you, right? They're like, yeah, of course. And I was like, hey, like, I say, hey, this is not cool. And I was like, come on, man, put it back. And the guy looked at me, and then like three of them were standing there. I was like, oh, typical first years, arrogant, this is this. And I was like, no, like, come on, man, it's a coach driver. And they gave the money back. So there's bits of where I kind of like had to stand up to it and was terrified, mm -hmm. but I'm also self-critical. So there's a lot of this. Hopefully you'll read the book and be like, ah, oh, we can see where this, we can see where these people come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as hearing that, you do that. I mean, it's, 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 look, it's hard being a teenager full stop, whatever school you're in, but especially Eton. I can, I can only imagine, you know. The money. There was a bowl of cocaine on the table. There was a house party that, this wasn't at school, but someone I know went to a house party 
in the public school world, and they walk in, and there was a bowl of cocaine on the table. Gosh. And they tell me about this a few, um, a few years later, and I was like, what the hell? Like, what was your reaction? It's oh, I didn't take it. It's like, no, I don't mean that. I said, you're a black person. If they come, I said, if police walk in there, they will all have lawyers. Before the, the back door even shuts, there'll be lawyers everywhere except you. You're, that will become your bowl of cocaine. Yeah. It's not the same for us. And this, the book was weird because writing it, being at Eton was funny. It was like, um, it was like walking in space with a spacesuit on. Like, mm -hmm. the if you expose yourself to the atmosphere, it will kill you. Like, I knew that environment mm -hmm. was never going to be one which was for me. I was going there to study, get a great education and come out, but I was never going to be part of that world. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Like, you won't date people in that world because you're not the mm -hmm. right family. They won't network with you. You're not in the right, that's not your universe. Yeah, so I, I went. It was weird because I went there and I was kind of um, my foot was half in, half out the whole time. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. and I think that comes across that, in the book as well. Yeah, but that sounds like that was the right thing to do. I think that's quite a healthy way of of doing it. Really, yeah. um, it's just it's a completely a, another world. I clocked it because the ones that didn't, the ones that I won't name names, the ones that went all the way in. Yeah. The non-white people went all the way in and whatever, the ones from working class backgrounds, middle class backgrounds, in my case, that went in, adopted it. You see them now, it's like an algorithm. It's like talking to a computer, they're going, oh yes. They're like, their body language is like so exaggerated because they're so desperate to fit in. And they're like 30s, 40s, 50s. You see them now and they're like, it's broken something in them mm. because they've lost their empathy for the outside world or the world they came from. And I, you know, I grew up in quite a boring suburb of London, West Straighten. When I grew up, it was really boring, but actually, I'm so grateful for that boring area because it saved me. Yeah. Because you go home, like I was voted as a pre, I was elected as a prefect at Eden, which is a really prestigious thing. You go home that summer, no one gives a damn, no one cares. And it was so refreshing. It's like, no one gives, frankly, pardon my Spanish, no one gives a shit. Yeah. And this was such a liberation, actually. Like, mm. yeah. It's healthy. That, that's why you've now got a healthy outlook on things because... You know, you you had that normality when you went back home, you know? Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, but Danielle, honestly, like, there are just so many stories and things that happened. I was writing it back going, oh, this is quite mundane. But the more you look at it, like, mm -hmm. I mean, actually, to be honest with you, the notes are quite profound. So mm -hmm. I can tell you this now, like, the editor said, I can tell you this now because I'm fine. She said, it gives the impression of someone who is all but destroyed by the experience. Wow. She read it. I was just like, because here's the thing I've not really talked about at school. Mm -hmm. And I've had like, you look from the outside, my career has been, you know, I've got my name out there. But she read it and she goes, you read it. You actually read like what it did psychologically because what you're trying to do is at the age of 13, you're looking at a world which is unsafe for the ego and you're going, I'm trying to manage it. It's like being in a kind of, it's weird because you're trying to learn and take all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. You're trying to edit out the class stuff. You're trying to be like, this is not a normal world. Like most people don't go to school with millionaires and billionaires. Like mm -hmm. most people don't get infinite second chances. Like, you know, a school like Eton, if you've got a drug problem, you go to South America for two years and you dry out and you come back into a corporate job. In the real world, if you do that, you're done for. You, yeah, the, mm -hmm. kind of drug, the kind of drug problem these people have in the real world, you're, you're sleeping on a park bench. Yeah. But, it, but at Eton, you get a safe net. You're always employable somewhere. You're always bounced back. It's always going to be someone who covers the school fees for you. And I just thought to myself, is you know, here's the equivalent. Being at Eton, when you're someone who's not from that world, do you know when you like look out of the window and you're in a plane and you mm. see the clouds and the clouds are there and they're so, they're so lovely. It feels like if I, I could just walk on them. Wow. I could, walk on, I could walk on them, but actually, in the average person, you walk on a cloud, you go... And the Etonian, <laughs> the wealthy Etonian floats, and that's the difference. Gosh. That's the difference. It's surreal. It sounds so surreal. It really, really does. It's absolutely would you, wild. Would you say there was a lot of like toxic masculinity there as well? Because that's from what you're saying. It, it seems like that was off the Richter scale. Off the scale. Mm. Do you know what it was? There's a way that people look at you from that world. I've seen arrogance before. I've experienced it. I've played football, Sunday league. I've, mm. I've seen aggressive men before. Yeah. There is a way that a wealthy racist looks at you that I've yeah. never seen before. Yeah. I've never seen before. There's a way that a wealthy racist looks at you where it's like their eyes are made of glass. Mm. It's like you're a stat on a sheet. Like you don't exist. And it was the weirdest thing. You walk up to the street and they kind of look, they angle their heads, they kind of look right through you 
or they'll examine you from like the ankle up and they'll stop at your eyes like you're like a piece of meat hanging from a rack. Ah. Like, absolutely, and I, I won't name names because those people know who they are and people that read the book will know who they are. And there's no mm -hmm. identifiers, but people will be like, I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. But yeah, we know who they are. Yeah. And there's no, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, sorry. That's, yeah. Sorry, that, but that's so hard for, you know, a teenager to go through. I mean, it's just hard being a teenager full stop, but having to deal, to deal with all that, you know, and yeah. uh, kind of like mind games, isn't it? You know, when yeah. someone looks at you in that way, it's like, you question everything about yourself, you yeah. know? And the worst, the only reason I did it was because I was, looking back, the reason why that place didn't destroy me was because I'm quite robust, actually, mentally. When it comes mm -hmm. down to it, I fight my corner. And like, so one of the worst experiences that happened to me, it basically made my life miserable there for two and a half years. It wasn't even to do with me. So there was a guy, for example, so this is the story, right? So there was one guy who was really loaded. Well, like a lot of them, one guy was absolutely loaded. And he, someone said, oh yeah, that guy gets so-and-so before one of the classes, someone said, oh, that guy gets like so-and-so a month from his dad an allowance. So I was like, oh, that's quite a lot of money. Yeah. That was it. That was all I said. I lit all I said was, oh, that's oh, that's quite a lot. It's quite a big allowance. But that was it because you know there's a lot of world people at school. It's not a big deal. You yeah. weren't you weren't jealous of the world. You're like, oh, that's quite a lot, considering that we're at boarding school. Like that's a lot of allowance. But anyway, that's literally all I said. That one sentence. He comes up to me. Two weeks later, after football training, we're all walking back from like football training. There's seven of us. There's seven of his mates. Him and seven mates. Six mates. Sorry. Him and six mates and me. And he goes what's the shit you've been stirring about my father's financial affairs? So the Chinese whisper has gone from me going, that's a lot of money, to me slagging off his father. And I'm like, I don't even know what your father does for a living. I don't even, what's this? And then they basically, he's going at me for like half an hour. And someone in his circle has got it in for me, has said that. And then he piles in and he doesn't want to believe me. Mm -hmm. So then we then have this horrible feud that lasts two and a half years based on that. And it's hate. When I see him in the street, he's looking at me with pure hate. This goes on for two and a half years. And I did nothing, nothing at all. And then he says, during the two and a half years, he says to me, well, he doesn't say it to me. Someone comes back to me and says, this guy said that he hates you so much that he wishes he could tell you that one of his ancestors was a slave driver. A slave driver. This guy's great grandfather owned slaves. Oh my God. Now, here's the thing. I get told this and I'm like, when did he say this? Where yeah. did he say it? He said this in a class of 20 people and it took months to get back from me. So he said this in front of people who know me and they said nothing for months, including you. That says a lot about this. Mm -hmm. It took months to get back to me. A false rumour got back to me in, a, in two days that I didn't even say. And this happens and he didn't tell me for months. These are not my friends. No. And this what they went at me. This happened two and a half years. The shit went on, two and a half years. It uh, it shows you who's controlling the school, isn't it? And it shows you what that kind of position that that, yeah. that, that those you know families are in and where these Horrifying. where these boys come from. Yeah, uh, yeah. Editor, I mean, my editor said to me, she said, "Ah, oh, like um, sometimes in the stories you hold back, it's not clear who the people are from the details you give." And I'm like, lawsuits, and we're kids. <laughs> But I think the stories will tell the story. Just telling you the stories without any names, they're powerful enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I said, you do not want to know the stories I did not include. There are stories I did not include in that. Mm. That's all mm. I'll say. Like, people know it. Like, and it's not, people that read it will be like, okay, standard. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. sure. Well, I just think it's incredible that you've done that, really. And I'm, I'm, I honestly can't wait to read it because just powerful stuff people need to know this yeah. people need to know from a person who has, has been able to you dipped in and out of that world yeah and you know you it's you need to hear it from somebody like you for sure and i hope people will see from it that actually um i hope what people take from it is this guy went through this environment and he represented he didn't sell us out like mm. he didn't disrespect us even when I'm ignorant sometimes, like hopefully they'll be like, this guy learned, like, and mm. if he can learn, if he can learn, others can learn. And this is the thing, I'm sure people are gonna ask me, oh, what do you hope to achieve? And I was like, actually, I'm, I don't flatter myself because if people dying in disproportionate amounts, the rest of the world can't convince the UK that things are wrong with the class system, yeah. then what's a book gonna do? But I don't flatter, yeah. I don't flatter myself. 
I just have exactly. to say, I have to say my piece, Danielle. I have to say Absolutely. my piece. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's good for you as well to, to put that down and get that out. It's, 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 it's much for everybody else as it is for yourself as well. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing for you to do. And it's funny, what you, it's funny, what, well, it's interesting what you were saying about um, not selling out. Um, there's a tweet that, um, that when I saw it from you, I was like, I need to follow this guy. He's, a, he's right. I need to know more about him. Was what you said about um, the gatekeepers, about um, Pretty Patel and yeah. Savvy Javid and uh, what was it now? I, I wrote it down because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, you said about um, the advances for nightclubs that they'll never be admitted into. And I just thought, I was just like, that, that is exactly, in a tweet, that is exactly um, the problem here, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, this is so true, Danielle. Like, people like that are like, they're sitting there going, oh, yeah, like, we defend this ideology. This like, The ideology hates you. Yeah. It fundamentally hates you. And, you know, it's one thing for people like, you know, people like to say, oh, Trump is not racist. And Piers Morgan, of all people, Trump's not a white supremacist. Look at his, you know, he's got so many friends around him. It's like, well, yeah, but who's calling the shots? Yeah. White supremacy is about a system of order. So ultimately, they're not going to take orders from these people. They can have you in a cabinet, but mm -hmm. ultimately, they're not going to allow you to control them. And it's yeah. very, very subtle in that respect. And, well, to me, it's obvious, but then it's subtle. Yeah. Because they're yeah. clowns. They don't want to see it. They're absolute clowns. Um, but I'm but glad you know what? That, yeah, sorry, Karen, 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 Karen. Sorry, I'm saying, do you know what it is, though? It's a sense of um, forgetting where you come from, isn't it? You know, I, um, you know, I'm very proud of where I come from and my roots. And I think with these people, it's a kind of, oh, I've stepped up the ladder now. Um, yes, um, you know, I'm, I'm of this um, ethnicity, but actually, you know, I, I've got this new new life now, and uh, you know, I don't need that. You know, let, let's forget where I've come. Let's forget where I've come from. And you know, my granddad used to say, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know who you are. Exactly. You, know, you don't, you don't, you don't know who you are. You know, don't, don't, you know. Um, that was my granddad's one of his favorite things to say. He was a Muslim, but he, you know, he said, if you don't know your foundation you've got nothing strong um, to stand on. There's no concrete underneath your feet, you know, and I yeah. certainly stand by that. And they're an example of actually forgetting who they are. You know, uh, they... Yeah, and this is a scary thing sometimes because they think that wealth extracts them from the conversation. And they think that just because they're fine, they forget they've got, you know, because most of their relatives will be working class and, you know, doing jobs that until two weeks ago, in the eyes of many Brits, were not essential labour, when as we always knew they were. Mm -hmm. And it's just funny how often those people will throw other non-white people under the bus. And again, mm. I'm, not, I'm not saying anything new here. No, you're um, not, no. But it's just, it's grim that it has to be repeated so often. Mm. And, you know, I hate to say it, but in the UK at the moment, like, there's a whole thing of, like, you appoint a lot of people who are non-white to these positions of authority, and then you go, okay, the problem is solved. Even though you've appointed those people precisely because... They hold the same racist ideologies you do. And someone said to me, oh, my God, you can't be black and be racist. I was like, mm, yeah, you can be black and hate black. You can definitely black and hate black people. I know because I know people like that. Yeah, I know, I know so do I. Because, so oh, do I. Hey, Alice, I got, I got a wave there. How's it going, Mimi? How's it going? How's it going? Miriam, there she is. Um, it's an ideology, uh, white supremacy, and anyone can have it. In the same way that anyone can have misogyny, regardless of their gender. Like, it's an ideology you can sign up to. Like, all, all are welcome. All are welcome. For sure, for sure. But isn't it isn't it funny? Because I, I, I find it interesting that these people like Zabi Javid and Priti Patel, they've been eerily quiet actually during this um during the virus. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And and I'm just like, hmm, that this yeah, what I mean, why I mean, especially after, you know, obviously the, the report come out um ethnic minorities and the and the COVID risk. Where are you? You're an ethnic minority. Why are you not speaking? Why are you not saying anything saying anything, you know? And uh, for people who think that they are standing for you as an ethnic minority, you got it twisted, you know? Well, you know, it's interesting about um, Sajid Javid being quiet. When he wants to be visible, he's super visible. Same with Pretty Patel. When she wants to make her big speech for any freedom of movement, you can't get enough of Pretty Patel. Where Sajid, Sajid Javid was on a holiday in South Africa, but he was so desperate to do racism and xenophobia, he came back from overseas to stand on the channel. So my guy, my guy can be front and centre when he wants, but he's laying low. He's chilling. He's happy. Oh, my God, I've been, I've been frozen out. When Donald Trump came and humiliated him, 
Trump mm -hmm. invited everyone except Sadiq Javid. He was the highest ranking person not to be invited. Oh, I'm not sure why. You know why you weren't invited. You're playing yeah. the long game. You're yeah. Playing, but it's a clown show. It's a clown it is a clown car. show. It's a clown car. Someone said, yeah. the, the dearly departed uh, Mac folk, shout out to Mac. We're in the, Mac is one of the, sort of the founding members of um, the Berlin techno scene. Hopefully a couple listening will know Mac. He's a uh, shout out wherever he is now. He passed away just before the, um, the lockdown at the age of 55, rest his soul. And Mac, uh, Mac said about the Trump administration, you could apply it to Boris Johnson's government as well. It's just amazing to see how many fools they can stuff into this clown car. And I, to me, I'm like, ha, ha, ha. You know the TARDIS? You know the TARDIS? When you walk into the TARDIS, yeah. not to who? It's much yeah. the inside and the outside. The yeah. government is like a TARDIS for clowns. It's just, yeah. you, can just keep <laughs> stuff, you can just keep stuffing more. <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> it's, it's just, it, like you said, it's just wild. It is just Absolutely wild. wild. It's off the scale. Just crazy. It's, but it's so good to get your perspective from being outside, you know, outside of the UK now, looking on in. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. But um, in, indulge me a second as a fellow writer. Um, I wanted to know, obviously you write, you write um, fiction, non-fiction, and I remember seeing a Instagram post about, um, this was non-fiction, I believe this is a personal story of yours, about um, you were passing an underpass with your sister. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, were going to, you were going to the opticians, is yeah, that my, right? My, my older, my, one of my older sisters, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you see a man. I, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you tell this, but um, I just, I just remember reading it and just, just being, just like how, how you can get that down on, you know, on paper. I just find that, you know, it's so. You, I, I love the fact you're so willing to be, to be open about these. These are deeply personal, raw um, encounters that you're that you've experienced in your life and you know I, I think actually some of the best writing comes from allowing yourself to be open and um you know be be open and honest and but for me as a writer I, I just had to I, I yeah I thought that was incredible to do that but can you finish can you finish that story no first of all um first of all thank you so much for identifying that as a piece you liked because just a short Instagram post. It's actually an extract from this memoir. It's an extract. Okay. It's part, ah, it's part okay. of that because the memoir basically takes place at home, in my home, right. also at school. And so the, the post you're referring to is where I was with an, um, one of my older sisters going to the opticians one day. And as we go under the railway bridge, we see a guy. And it's like broad daylight. This is in the mid '90s, so I must be I'm mid, I'm mid teens. I would have I would have thought. Mm. We're walking underneath this bridge, and just before we go under the bridge, we see this guy standing to the side. And he's looking, and he just, it's a split, the look he gives me, it's just like, he couldn't hide it. Like, he couldn't hide the hate. You know, mm -hmm. if you're smart, you can hide it, but he couldn't hide it. Mm -hmm. And it was just there. It was like being, it was like, it was like you know, when you look at the sun, for example, without your sunglasses on, it was like searing. And I was like, whoa, that is dangerous. So I like, we crossed, we, we went over to the opticians under the bridge. And I said, when we come out of the opticians, mm -hmm. let's cross the road and go like to the bus stop through a different way. And she's like, why? I said, no, that guy, like, wasn't right. So an hour later, come out the opticians, yeah. cross the road, get on the bus. And as we're going out um, through the kind of, like, West Drayton bus station, it's got the kind of the 222 bus going to Uxbridge, you come out of the bus, the bus, the uh, train station, and we look out, and the man is standing where he was an hour ago, waiting for us to come back through the tunnel, through the, through the bridge, under the bridge. And he smiles as in, like, you got me. And he opens his jacket up, and it was like patchwork swastikas. And someone wrote to me and she said to me, this is a traumatic memory. I wonder if it actually happened at all. And I was, what? Like, I was like, no, that happened. Like that was a cinematic memory that like, I can tell you about. I was writing in the local um, library. I was doing my revision one time and I was writing my notes for my GCSEs and my pen got stuck in a groove. And mm. I, I picked up picked the paper and someone had carved the initials of the National Front into the desk where I was sitting. This was just here. It was just there in plain sight. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, and, and how I wrote that, just to get back to the technical side of writing. Yeah. yeah. I always think when you're writing articles like that or pieces of work, always say one thing. 
<laughs> don't talk about like multiple events. Describe one event in one passage and be as open as possible. The reason why I said it's this, we're in a time where people find it very difficult to open up about um, that they might be wrong about stuff.